Uh, I would say you look good, because I'm, I'm pretty sure you do, but I can't see most of you. So I'm just going to go by your cheer, that you're excited and you're happy to be here. Uh, guys, I'm really excited for tonight. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Alex, and I'm the assistant site pastor here at Mac, or for you office fans, the assistant to the site pastor here at Mac. <laughs> Got some office fans here? All right, good, good, good. Really excited to uh, jump into God's Word with you guys tonight, share something that has been on my heart this week, in our last week of Lord, Lord. Everybody say, Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord. We've been in this series for uh, some time. And tonight's the last night, but it's not a sad night. It's an exciting night, because next week there'll be something else just as exciting. So if you guys are ready to go, why don't you uh, grab your Bibles if you have one. There should be one uh, on the chair around you as well, or a neighbor who I'm sure would share. We'll have it on the screens. We're going to read I read a, a fair bit tonight, but it's, a, it's an incredible story from Luke chapter 22. An incredible story that uh, I hope and pray that God will speak to us through tonight. So Luke 22, we're going to start in verse 39. Listen to this. It says, then accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and he went as usual to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. Listen to his prayer, church. He said, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. He's just days away from the cross. Verse 43, then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. At last, he stood up again, and he returned to the disciples, only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall, give in to temptation. But even as Jesus said this, a crowd approached, led by Judas, one of the twelve disciples. Judas walked over to Jesus to greet him with a kiss. But Jesus said, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? When the other disciples saw what was about to happen, they exclaimed, Lord, should we fight? We brought the swords. I love it. They're so, they're so ready to go. And one of them struck at the high priest's slave, slashing off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. He touched the man's ear and he healed him. Then Jesus spoke to the leading priests, the captains of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him. Am I some dangerous revolutionary, he asked, that you would come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there every day. But this is your moment, the time when the power of darkness reigns. And finally, verse 54. So they arrested him and led him to the high priest's home, and Peter followed at a distance. Why don't you pray with me one more time, church? Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that it is so much more than a collection of stories. It is so much more than a historical account. God, it is your word to us. It is your voice. And Jesus, we believe that your word is alive and it is active. And the reason we open it tonight, Lord, is because we want to hear from you. Jesus, we pray that you would speak to us. Speak to us individually. Speak to us as your church. God, make these moments that we come around your word more than a lecture, more than time that we just sit through in order to get to the hot dogs. God, make them an encounter with you, Jesus. Prepare our hearts for all that you want to do and say tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, that was quite the night, wasn't it, that we just read? I want to give a little bit of context to what we just read because it's an incredible, an incredible moment that I believe we can learn from in big ways. So this night, before Jesus even begins to pray, this night started in a very familiar way. It started around the supper table. Who here likes to eat? Yeah. All right. So Jesus and the disciples, they, of course, love to eat. They love to eat together. A common occurrence was for Jesus and his disciples to share a meal. They had done this hundreds of times, but this night was different. This night was different. The disciples didn't fully get it, but they knew, they could feel something was different. You see, church, for some time, Jesus had been speaking about the fact that uh, the time was coming for him to leave earth. And he was going to leave earth in quite a dramatic and painful way. And, and, and he was saying more and more, the time is coming, the time is coming. And on this night, he said, the time is tonight. And the disciples didn't fully get or understand what that meant, but they knew that this, this is happening 
tonight. And it was in this, this moment, this dramatic, emotional, tension-filled moment around the supper table that Jesus gives them what we're going to celebrate tonight, communion, the Lord's Supper. It's incre- this incredible symbol of his love and his promise, what his sacrifice for us would mean, new life. But right after he gives them the Lord's Supper, guess what he does? He says, okay, guys, um, so tonight's going down, and you're all going to fail me. I don't know if you've ever been to an awkward dinner party before. Again, back to the office. But, I mean, can you imagine? Jesus, we're we're not going to fail you. He said, one of you, speaking of Judas, as we know, you're just going to outright betray me for, for a small payment of money. Uh, another one's going to deny me a couple times, but, even, but all of you, you're going to fall away on account of me. And in that moment, Peter, as he so often did, if you, read the, if you read the Gospels, Peter's always the one to speak up. Do you remember what Peter says? He said, no, no, Lord, not me. Not me. I promise you, Jesus, I'm ready to go to prison with you. I'm even ready to die with you. You can read that earlier in verse 33. Fast forward a few hours after supper now to the story we just read. Jesus is in the garden, the time was coming, and with Peter's bold words still ringing, the moment arrives. Do you know what I mean by the moment? It's that situation that comes up that you just prayed about, that you just lifted your hand at church and you said, no more, God, I'm done with this. And fast forward a couple hours, sometimes minutes, and the situation arises where you're now faced with an opportunity. The stage is set. Are your actions going to follow the commitment you just made? Yes, God, I will follow you. No more of this. Maybe it's for you. It's like, you know what, God? I am done with gossip. I want to I speak words that are encouraging and uplifting. I'm done with gossip. And then after church, somebody goes, hey, let's, go, let's grab Starbucks. Let's hang out. Sure, yeah, yeah. I'm done with gossip. I'm done with gossip. Hey, did you hear about so-and-so? Oh, you don't even know. Wait, what? What? The moment, the moment happened so quickly. It came quickly for the disciples, didn't it? It came real quick for the disciples. Look again at verse 47. Verse 47. But even as Jesus was trying to wake them up from their sleep, a crowd approached led by Judas, one of the twelve. So Judas, his moment's already come and gone. Judas walked over to Jesus to greet him with a kiss. But, But Jesus said to Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? But listen to this, church. It wasn't just Judas. He gets an unfair route. Everyone fell away. When the other disciples saw what was about to happen, they exclaimed, Lord, should we fight? We brought the swords. And one of them, Luke says, one of them, not going to name any names, (laughs) struck at the high priest slave slashing off his right ear. I love the Bible. Anyone who says the Bible's boring hasn't read the Bible. Because if you read this story in other accounts, for example, John, Okay, Luke says, one of us, one of us took out a sword and did something stupid. John goes, that was Peter. Yeah, that was Peter. I'm not even kidding. Guys, look it up tonight. It's hilarious. He's like, Peter totally took out his sword and cut off his ear. I don't know if Luke just forgot or just trying to cover up his buddy, but John and Peter were a bit closer. He's like, dude, that was you. Admit it. It was Peter. In many ways, I read that church and I go, you know what? You know what? Part of me likes Peter. He's the kind of friend you want. You know, he like, even though it's like so dumb and like you're not going to make a difference, like some commentators believe, guys, that there was hundreds, if not a thousand people here to arrest Jesus, one man. What's Peter going to do? That's one year, okay? We got 2,000 more to go. He's so passionate. He's, he, he's so, he wants to, doesn't he? He's trying so hard, but he's so misguided. Don't you get the impression that the disciples are not aligned at all with what Jesus is trying to do? You see, church, he was trying to give up his life, and the disciples were like, how can we prevent it? And Jesus was like, I want you to pray with me. I'm trying to do something else here. I'm thankful for them, the disciples, and their example, because I can relate to that. We can relate to that, can't we? They're often lack of alignment. Jesus is here and they're over here. I can relate to that. It's exactly what Robin's been talking about this entire Lord, Lord series. It's based on that question that we we heard every week when Jesus said, why do you call me Lord? Why do you say I'm your Lord, but you don't do what I say? He's talking about alignment, wasn't he? 
He's talking about what it means to follow him. It means more than just good Christian talk. It means aligning your heart, your life, your will, your your emotions, your hopes and dreams under his authority. He's talking about alignment. Not just learning the culture and being able to talk the talk, but actually come under God as your authority and say, whatever you say, God, your will be done in my life. You speak. You guide. You direct me. That's been a strong but life-changing invitation that we've heard over the past few weeks, and yet we can relate to Peter, can't we? We get it. We're with Peter. We see ourselves in him. We, 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 we look at that and we go, I, I get it, Peter. I'm the same way. I hear what Jesus says. I know what he says. I even know what it means for my life, and I want to do it. But when the moment comes, when the moment comes, so often what happens in that moment is my voice wins out over God's voice, Right? I can hear it, but I just, I want to go my way. I want to be Lord. That's that's us. It's a lot easier to fight for Jesus and to fight to attack, to get into debates on Facebook and fight for Jesus than it is to die for him. Even Paul struggled with this. Listen to, I'm going to read part of Romans 7 tonight. I hope it's okay. Listen to this because I find it hilarious and also really close to home. Listen to what Paul says. He's just venting one day in a letter. Romans 7 verse 19. He's talking to a church, and he goes, I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It's sin living in me that does it. He said, I've discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. I want to do it, but there is another power within me that's at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. And then, we, and, then, and then he gives the line that we often say to ourselves, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Oh, Paul, it's going to get better. Tell Paul it's going to get better. It's going to get better. I know and I want to, and yet so often I can't or I don't. So two years ago, I can't believe it's already been two years. It feels like it was yesterday. But two years ago, my wife, Rachel, who's here somewhere tonight, I think, Oh, right in the front. Wow. Hey, guys. Um, My wife, Rachel, spent uh, over 40 days in the hospital over the course of a couple months. And for most of the time, we had no idea what was wrong. But she was extremely sick. And when I say extremely, I mean like almost tragic at one point. I think we had four trips to the eMERGE, a couple in an ambulance. And if you've ever been there, either the one in the ER or the one waiting in the, the waiting room for the loved one, you know that it's one of the worst experiences you'll ever have. It's one of those seasons, though, as Christians, we talk about, if that comes in my life, I'm going to stand with you, God. I'm going to weather the storm knowing that, Jesus, you're in the boat, and I'm going to praise you, and I'm going to be joyful and trusting. I'm here to tell you, church, that was not me over those 40 days. I remember this one time, that I wrote this in my journal because I was trying to write a sermon on this exact story that we're talking about tonight. And it was day 12, little did I know, we, were, we, were, we still had a long way to go. But I remember writing in my journal, I, I remember saying, I wish I could tell you that for all 12 days I've been at peace, trusting, reasonable, responding like Jesus would. But I wonder if I'm any different than the disciples who scattered and cracked under pressure. Now, just a real quick side note, Rachel's here and healthy, and her health is a testament to God's will. So I want to, I got to tell you the story sometime, but let me just say that, I'll give you a teaser. Any time that a specialist, one of the smartest people in our city, in our province says, hey, I have good news, but I can't explain it, we go, we can, because we prayed, and it's our God. Um, so her health is incredible, and it's an amazing story. But in, that, in those 40 days, church, it was one of those experiences where I said, I wish I could tell you I was aligned with what God wanted me to do, but I was over here saying, God, no, no, this is too tough. I'm Lord. I'm going to respond the way I want to respond. We get it. We've been there. The truth is, this life of following Jesus, it requires alignment, our lives under the authority of God. But too often, what do we do? We keep God right here on the side because that's how we were raised and it feels good. It's comforting. He's close by if we get into trouble. We keep him on the side, but we don't come under his authority. 
We don't give them the space to say, no, Jesus, I want what you want in my relationships, in my identity, in my finances, in my career, in my sexuality. We keep them over here for when things go wrong, but we don't come underneath his authority. The problem is, the reason is, because it's hard, isn't it? It doesn't happen automatically. Has anyone else been sitting here these past few weeks hearing Robin go, why do you call Jesus Lord and you don't do what he says and you want to respond, because it's hard? <laughs> It's not easy. The problem is, church, more specifically, we often only worry about this alignment with God when we're in that moment, on the spot, when the storm hits, when the temptation comes, and at that point, it's way too late. When the moment comes, when the heat's applied, when, the, when Judas, the betrayer, is walking across the garden, it's too late because, church, when that happens, your usual comes out. Whatever you've been building, whatever you've been practicing, whatever you've been developing in your relationship with God, that comes out. And so if you wait till the mob arrives and you see Judas the betrayer, what's going to happen? Alignment with God's will isn't happening. What does Peter do? Let's fight. This is self-preservation. We're going to get back at him. He hurt us. Church, if you wait until Saturday night at the bar to align with what you know God's wanting you to do, it's not going to happen. You're going to leave saying, I know, I know, I know, but I couldn't in the moment because you're fighting against yourself. If you wait until that next fight with your boyfriend, with your girlfriend, before you align with what you know God wants you to do, it's not going to happen. But there's hope. Do you need some hope? You're like, yeah, we're like 15 minutes in and there's no good news here. There's good news. <laughs> how can we actually live with God? With how can we actually live with Jesus as our Lord, doing what he's called us to do? The good news is Jesus shows us. He's going to show us. You ready? You ready? Okay. I can go if you're not ready. I'm just kidding. Verse 42, listen to this. Listen to how and what Jesus prays. He says, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him, and he prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. We need to understand something, church. Yes, Jesus is God, and yes, he was God while on earth, but the steps towards the cross were not automatic because he was God. The Bible says he was also fully human. So we can't get this picture that Jesus just cruised through life on earth like, I'm God, no big deal, we're going to the cross. Look at how he's praying, church. The Bible says that he was made exactly like we are, flesh, bones, human emotion, human pain, but he never sinned. But that didn't come automatically. Look at how he prays to the Father. What's he doing? He's aligning, isn't he? He's aligning. Father, here's what I want. Here's what my, my body's saying, but not what I want. May your will be done. Father, if there's another way, I'd kind of prefer it. If there's another way other than the cross, I'd prefer it. But, 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 not what I want, what your, I want your will to be done. And he prayed, and he prayed, and he kept praying intensely, and he kept praying, and he kept aligning. I love it. I love this image of Jesus working it out. Even after an angel comes and strengthens him, Luke says he prayed more intensely. Church, we could take a lesson right here from our from our Savior, from our model prayer. How often do we pray just enough to feel better? You know, like we're anxious and we pray just a little bit, just enough that we feel better. I'm afraid about something, so I'll pray just enough so I feel better. But prayer isn't about us feeling better. It's about aligning with, God, what do you want to do here? And can you bring my heart, can you bring my mind into that? That's what Jesus did. He prayed so intensely. Luke says, I can only describe it this way. His sweat was like blood falling to the ground. He prayed all night. He didn't want to continue on with that night until he'd aligned with the Father's plan and the Father's will. Now, a quick side note. You might think, well, this sounds terrible. <laughs> um, he prayed all night, and he sweat out blood, and then he had to go to the cross. But church, let's hear something so important. Scripture interprets Scripture. Hebrews 12, 2 says that for the joy set before him, Jesus went to the cross. This was not a matter of, uh, I'm going to pray all night and hope that, and hope that the Father takes this away from me. And while he didn't, okay, i got to suck it up and go with it. No, no, no. He prayed all night and he left church and he goes, this is the Father's plan. And the Bible says, for the joy set before him, he went to the cross for you. I think some people here are pushing back on what God is 
calling you to do because you think it's going to be difficult and challenging and while it might be, you need to understand, church, when you come under his authority, that's where you find life. That's where you find joy and purpose you never imagined you could know. It's under God's authority. This was the fight. This was the fight that Jesus wanted the disciples to join him in. Not a fight with swords, but a fight of following God, a fight of surrender. And that's the more he's calling us to as well. The fight to follow, the fight to surrender our hopes, our ambitions, our dreams, our own weaknesses under God's authority. This fight that God's calling us to doesn't have us raising swords, but getting on our knees daily and saying, God, God here's what I want. God, here's what my self-centeredness wants, but, but I give it to you. May your will be done in my life, in my job, in my relationships, in my finances, you name it, God, your will be done. Church, I believe as much as our singing and our praise of worship honors God, I believe this is the greatest sound of worship we can give. The sound of hearts bowing and surrender before God, saying, I'm not Lord, you are. What would you have me do? Okay, so Jesus shows us, but I also want you to notice two words. Two words that just leapt off the page for me this week. Following this emotional and difficult night, the, la the Last Supper, he knows what he's about to face. He knows how the disciples are going to betray him. And listen to how Luke describes what Jesus did in verse 39. He says, then, accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went how? Went how? As usual, to the Mount of Olives. He went out to pray. Why? Because tonight was going to be a really tough night. He went out to pray. Why? Because tonight was going to be really scary. No, no. He went out as he always did. He went out to pray as usual. Church, when the moment comes, your usual comes out. This was Jesus as usual. What's yours? For Jesus, this was it. It wasn't some special case. I should probably really spend the night praying because it's almost time I go to the cross. He did this all the time. This was what he did. Regular time with the Father. This, and this prayer itself, specifically, not what I want, but your will be done. And the reason I know that that's what his usual was, church, not only do we read that he went out and spent time in prayer throughout the Gospels, but when the disciples asked Jesus, teach us, can you teach us how to pray? Robin read it tonight. What does he say? He, here's how I pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He didn't wait for the moment to come. He didn't wait for life to get difficult. This was his usual. Even after the, even in the good days, even when he was strengthened, even when he was praising the Father, his prayer was still, Father, may your will be done. Who here knows that it's not the bad days, the bad seasons that take us away from prayer? It's the good ones, right? It's the good seasons. It's the semesters where uh, school's going good, relationships are good, we actually have money in the bank, life's going good. That's what takes us away from prayer. But church, it was even in those moments when Jesus got on his knees and said, Father, I praise you because you are good. May your will continue to be done in my life. Why do we so often call him Lord, but not do what he says, and then leave depressed and frustrated and guilty? Because our usual isn't alignment with what he wants from us. So in the moment, though we want to and we try, we're fighting this uphill battle against ourselves, and we're fighting it in our own strength. And our actual usual comes out, selfishness, lust, gossip, bitterness, defensiveness. It becomes all about me and my kingdom and my self-preservation. But church, following Jesus involves the mountaintop emotional moments and the seemingly mundane Monday morning prayers on your knees saying, God, I want your will to be done in my life. Aligning your heart with what he wants beforehand. Following Jesus involves standing and lifting our hands in worship, but also getting on our knees when no one else is around and saying, Jesus, I'm really mad at my dad. I'm not. I'm really mad at my dad, and I want to lash out, but that's my will. What's your will? Allow me to see him like you do. The next time I talk to him, may be filled with, with you and seasoned with grace. Church, following Jesus involves getting on our knees and saying, I don't want to be that guy, that girl anymore who's known for the crude, inappropriate humor, but I'm just so desperate for attention. 
Remind me who I am in you. Jesus, remind me that I don't need to, to go to those lengths to get attention. I'm going to brag on Rob in a minute because I know he won't do it himself. This is why when he told that story of how he responded with grace after the accident, church, this is why Robin was able to do that. It wasn't because he was disciplined in the moment to go, I'm really upset and angry. I'm going to pull. I'm going to align myself with what God wants me to do right now. No, no. It didn't happen in the moment. He responded that way because every day before that accident, that's his prayer. Jesus, would your will be done in my life, in my job, in my, in my marriage, in my parenting? And when the moment comes, your usual comes out. What's your usual? What's your usual right now? But my second and final question, and, and everyone's like perking up. Yeah, final. That's good. Good word, final. <laughs> your second, my second and final question is, what could your usual become? What could your new usual be? You see, I, I'm worried that some of you have already decided that this could never be you. I just get the sense that some people have already disqualified themselves from this kind of relationship with God because you think, well, that's, that's for like really special and spiritual people, right? Like, that's, that's for people like Robin who are really spiritual. Please hear me tonight, church. No one needs to be disqualified because aligning with God's authority in your life requires access. And guess what? You can have access to him, personal relationship access to the God of the universe. It's not about being special or somehow extra spiritual. You can have this personal access to the God of the universe for one reason and one reason only. Because Jesus lived on this earth and he did everything he asked us to do. And though he lived like we do, he was perfectly obedient to the Father. And the Bible says that he who had no sin became sin for us that we might become. Do you know it? We might become the righteousness of God. That we might know God. This is what the night in the garden is so, it means so much. We've been talking about all the things Jesus said. Now look at what he did. One more time. Verse 51. After Peter goes crazy with the sword, Jesus said, no more. Okay, that's it, Peter. No more. And, I, and just a side note, I love that he healed him too. Some, maybe someone's like, I, I've just done something so bad. Guess what? Jesus heals it. He works all things for good. He fixes it. Peter was probably immediately regretting it. Jesus is like, I got it, Peter. Put it away, but I got it. <laughs> he touched the man's ear and he healed him. Then Jesus spoke to the leading priests, the captains of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him. Am I some dangerous revolutionary, he asked, that you would come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there every day, but this is your moment. The time when the power of darkness reigns. So they arrested him. Now he's one step closer to the cross. Let's not get this wrong, church. Jesus didn't simply come to terms with the fact that, oh, oh shoot, Judas betrayed me. He tricked me. I'm overpowered. I should probably just call it, call it a night. He wasn't outsmarted. He wasn't overpowered. Because you see, the thing is, he wasn't there fighting to save his life. He was fighting to lay it down. That's our good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And you know, as I watch these events in the garden play out, I can't help but hit pause and go back in time to the book of Genesis to another story. Because it, ma it makes the story just so powerful. Again, I love the Bible. It's so awesome. Anyone who says the Bible's boring, you're boring. Read it. <laughs> I stole that. I'll go. There's a story, though. It, of another father-son, Abraham and Isaac. And this is a cool uh, story for many ways, but one of them is that Abraham and his wife Sarah, God t told them one day, he said, Abraham, I'm gonna make you the father, the beginning of a nation of people that I'm gonna call my own. And Abraham's like, cool, 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 cool. Um, but, but like, I'm, I'm old, and my wife's you know, not old, but like, father time's against us. We don't have any kids. So, so God, how are you going to do this, like making me a father of many nations when I don't have any kids and, and the biological clocks are ticking? And God says, don't worry about that. I'll, I'm going to give you a child. And, and again, I love the Bible. Sarah's in a tent and she starts laughing. It, honestly, this happens. She starts laughing and God goes, why are you laughing? She says, I didn't laugh. And God said, yes, you did laugh. 
I am going to give you a son. I'll be back this time next year. He said, I'm going to give you a son, a child of promise, and you're going to name him Isaac. Long story short, they make a mistake. God still comes through in his promise because that's our God. And he gives him a son, Isaac. When Isaac was about 10, 11, 12, one day God said to Abraham, okay, Abraham, that son that I gave you, the son you love, your only son, I want you to sacrifice him to me. Can you imagine? No, it's, you must be hearing this wrong. I want you to sacrifice Isaac to me. Just like, you know, at this time they would sacrifice an animal as a form of worship to God. So Abraham says, uh, okay. Begins to make his way up the mountainside with his son, Isaac carrying the wood for his altar, and Abraham carrying, the Bible says, fire and knives. They make their way up the mountainside, and Abraham builds the altar, and Isaac's starting to look around and go, uh, Dad, what's going on? And he actually says these words that are absolutely amazing. He said, Dad, where's the lamb? And Abraham says, God himself will provide. Abraham goes through the unthinkable of tying his own son to the altar. He takes a knife and he raises it above his head. But before he can do anything more, an angel intervenes and says, stop, Abraham, stop, don't harm him. Now I know that you trust God. And they looked over and there was a ram caught in the bushes and they sacrificed and they praised God. Fast forward to John chapter one. Jesus has just began his earthly ministry. John the Baptist knows about this Messiah, this Jesus guy. And listen to how he, descri- how he calls him out. He says, everyone, look, there he is. There he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Fast forward back to the garden now, the story we've been looking at. This time, the fire and the knives were carried by thousands of soldiers. Jesus was about to carry the wood for his own altar on the cross. And it doesn't matter how many times I read this story, I know how it ends, but I still find myself going, what's gonna happen? Is there gonna be another moment where heaven intervenes and goes, stop, no, 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 this is good, this is good. Jesus, you trust me, it's good. We want that ending. Where heaven intervenes and says, don't harm, don't harm him. Jesus could have called on heaven to stop this whole thing, church. He wasn't overpowered. One word, and that garden would have been filled with an army of angels that no humans could have withstood. But the order never came. It was silent. And though it was silent, make no mistake about it, it was an answer to prayer. It was an answer to Jesus' prayer. Dad, if this is the only way, then I want your will to be done. It was an answer to to prayer, church, because this was the plan. This was the plan with you in mind, with me in mind, with all humanity in mind. Talk about, talk about Jesus doing what he's asked us to do, love your enemies. He was doing this for people who were arresting him and about to kill him, for all of them. So church, I need you to hear this tonight. Jesus sacrificed everything for us, even for those who would never accept him. So whoever you are, whatever you think you've done, wherever you've come from, you need to know that you can be brought back to a personal relationship with the God of the universe, not because you're good, but because Jesus was and he gave it all up for you. He who had no sin became sin to give you the gift of life, new life, life with him. Let me close with this. Listen to how Paul closes that, you know, when he called himself miserable man, listen to this. We told him it was gonna get better. Verse 25, he says, thank God The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen? So you see how it is, he says, in my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. But, 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 but now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of our weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature but instead follow the Spirit. 
How good is that? Church, what is your usual? And what could it become? Is it time for you to begin to fight to follow, to fight to surrender? Why don't we pray together? As you take a moment uh, with your eyes, every eye closed, just in response.